Good morning. It is Wednesday, the 7th of July, 9, 12 a.m. I apologize, this, this video is a day late, but I wanted to make sure everybody had a chance to do their midterm exam, and I was grading midterm exams yesterday. Um, and speaking of midterms, I want to start this video out by saying that if anybody emails me between now and Monday, And Monday's date would be the 12th. So anytime between now and Monday, July 12th at 11.59 p.m. And if you tell me that you watched this video, I'll put five extra points on your midterm grade. So just to make sure it's clear, you email me between right now, which is July 7th, 9.13 a.m. now, and Monday, July 12th at 11.59 p.m., I will add five extra points to your final or to your midterm exam. All right, moving on, uh, as you see here, we're talking about ancient Rome, and this is gonna be about 20 to 25 slides long. It's really two lectures put into one. And normally, if this was a face-to-face -face class, we would go over ancient Rome in two different class periods. And it's broken into two parts. We've got the Roman Republic and then we've got the Roman Empire. And the Roman Republic came first. So let's let's look at this. And uh, geography of Italy. Italy, it's kind of this boot-shaped appendage that goes down into the Mediterranean Sea. To the north, you have the Alps. To the south, you have the Mediterranean Sea. Down the middle, you have the Apennines or the Apennines heard it said both ways. And then you have water at pretty much everywhere else. The Ligurian Sea, the Tyrrhenian Sea, the Adriatic Sea, the Ionian Sea, those are all actually parts of the Mediterranean. Now the importance of the Alps is they kept most invaders out. Not everybody was kept out. Like if you really, really wanted to get into Italy, you could, but it was very difficult because the Alps are tall and the Alps are very cold. The Apennines down the middle, think of them kind of like the Appalachian, except they're only about 30 to 60 miles wide and they average four to 5,000 feet tall, but some of them are up to nine and 10,000 feet tall. There are a lot of lakes and streams and valleys. And all of that is going to help fuel the development of civilization in Italy. There are three early groups of people that you should know and need to know for your final exam. It's the Etruscans, the Greeks, and the Latins. The Etruscans are from a part of Italy that we know today as Tuscany. So if you ever go to a, an Italian restaurant and they have something Tuscan on their menu, it's from the part of Italy known as Tuscany. And Tuscany was originally known as Etruria. Now these Etruscans, they were fairly advanced for their time period. And we don't really know where they came from. Their language is not completely translated. Uh, so what we do know comes a lot from archaeology and anthropology. So what the archaeology and the anthropology tells us is they probably only had two classes of people. They had an aristocracy or an upper class, probably some wealthy merchants and some craftsmen in there as well as the nobles. And then they had serfs or peasants. And it looks like there's a deep division between the governing class and the peasants, which caused some unrest and some issues in some of these Etruscan towns. We know the Etruscans heavily traded throughout the Italian peninsula. We know that the Etruscans traded throughout the Mediterranean. And the Etruscans, their main trading partners were the Greeks and a group of people called the Carthaginians who lived in northern 
half of it. This Etruscan trade brought them into contact with many cultural influences outside Italy. And the Etruscans borrowed very heavily from the Greeks. They borrowed art, they borrowed pottery, they borrowed their system of government, the idea of the polis, and they also borrowed religion. Zeus is Jupiter, Hera is Juno, Athena is Minerva, so on and so on. The Greeks are going to inhabit much of southern Italy. When the Greeks left their homeland to create colonies, southern Italy is where many of them went. In fact, there are so many Greeks that live in Italy that the Greek people called it Magna Gracia or Greater Greece. These Greeks they operated and lived in city-states just like they would if they were in Greece. They were not unified in any way. And if you were a colonist of Athens, you were still considered a citizen of Athens, even though you lived in southern Italy. Same thing with Sparta, Corinth, all those city-states. So there's lots and lots and lots of Greek culture that is operating in southern Italy. The last but not least, we have the Latins. The Latins are going to live along the river called the Tiber, T-I-B-E-R. And the Latins are a larger group of people, and because these Latins lived in the city of Rome, they're going to eventually become known as Romans. So Romans and Latins are interchangeable and that's why the language of Rome was called Latin because they were Latin people. Now the traditional founding date of Rome is 753 BC, although it looks like people actually lived on the site of Rome as early as 1400 BC. <clears throat> as the city grows it originally starts on top of the seven hills that surround the town. As the population grows, the seven hills start to grow together with people. And before you know it, Rome is a fairly sizable city. Now, the city was originally ruled by a monarchy. The Etruscans are going to conquer Rome in 616 BC. The Etruscan rulers are going to build the town into a city. They're going to drain the valleys. They're going to build temples and shrines and roads. And it's through the Etruscans that the Romans are going to learn about the outside world. And from 616 until 510 BC, the Romans are going to learn as much as they can from the Etruscans. And then they're going to turn around and use the Etruscans' own technology to defeat them and gain their independence. Now, once the Romans overthrow the Etruscans, the Romans themselves are gonna go on the offense. And before you know it, the Romans are conquering and taking over lands that surround the city of Rome. Now, this wasn't always done with military. Many times they would negotiate and they would form alliances with those around them. And then they would fight only if they couldn't make an agreement. But in reality, a lot of the, the Latins around them joined them voluntarily. So one example of a war that does not go so well is a war in where a guy named Cincinnatus gains legendary status in the Roman Republic. Now, Cincinnatus, his real name was Lucius Quintitius Cincinnatus. He was a Roman patrician, a Roman military legend, and <clears throat> he is going to defeat a group of people known as the Aqui. 
Now, this, the story behind this is that the Romans were originally using the battle or the war against the Aki. And when the Roman army starts to lose, the leaders of Rome basically panic. They go to Cincinnati and ask him to leave his farm and come back in his service. Cincinnati agrees to go and lead the troops. A couple days later, Cincinnati comes back and says the job is done. And the leaders of Rome are willing to give him the powers of a dictator. And Cincinnati basically says, no, no, no. I just did my duty for my people. And then voluntarily gives up all his powers. And basically says, I did it for the greater good. I did it to help the people. This act of selflessness became the ideal the image that all Romans were supposed to live up to. Now, overall, this Roman conquest of Italy is going to be fairly slow. They're going to conquer the Etrurians, offer them some citizenship, and the Roman Republic is going to grow a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. However, by 390 BC, a group of people known as the Gauls are going to attack the Romans and attack the city of Rome. Now, if you've never heard of the Gauls, it's okay. Uh, they're better known as the French today, but they're originally known as the Gauls. Now, what do these Gauls do? They go to Rome and they loot the city and they take over a thousand pounds worth of gold. Uh, today, that would be billions of dollars. The Romans are going to reorganize. They're going to redo their army and form what are known as legions. Each legion is going to be a mobile fighting unit of about 5,000 men. And they're going to be some of the best soldiers in the history of the world. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to go and just start killing everybody, diplomacy is still the primary way that the Roman army is going to do business. And the Romans are going to offer the people they conquer political power and citizenship so that they play nice and are going to join willingly. Now, those who are conquered also have to serve in the military. Those that are conquered also have to pay taxes whether they want to or not. In the Roman Republic, there are two classes of people. There's the plebeians and there's the patricians. The patricians are upper class. The plebeians are lower class. The patricians are mostly wealthy and the patricians are going to dominate Roman society. Plebeians, mostly poor, but some have a lot of money. And plebeians, even though they're not upper class, they're still free citizens. They still have a say in the happenings of the day. It's just that the way the system works is weighted more towards the patricians. Now, it's also important to, to let you know that your social class is not based on how much money you have. It's based on what family you're born into. That's why some plebeians were fairly rich, while some patricians were not it was all about what family and what clan they were built into. The Roman government was broke into two parts as well. You have the magistrates, and each magistrate served a one-year term. And then you had the Senate, officially known as the Senatus Populus K. Romanus, or the Senate and People of Rome. For the magistrates, there are two consuls. Uh, the consuls, they're the top officials. They're the ones in charge of making sure the laws are carried out. The case stores are in charge of the money and they prosecute criminals. The praetors are kind of like vice consuls. If the consuls away from the bus doing business trips or something, the praetors take over. The praetors are also the ones in charge of the justice administration. They're the ones in charge of the courts. And finally, you have censors. Uh, censors are the ones who 
police morals. And censors are the ones who decide how many Romans there are. They run the censa. And the censors are the ones who decide who can and cannot run for office. The Senate, on the other hand, they serve life terms. And they're advisors for the magistrates. The senators themselves cannot make laws. But when the Senate declares something, it is as good as law because they are so widely respected and looked up to. And we have an event in Roman history called the Struggle of the Orders. This is going to be a revolt of the lower class or a rebellion of the lower class. The plebeians, they basically have no political power at first. And in 494 BC, the plebeians are going to go on strike. They're going to quit working. They're going to quit serving in the military. And they're going to demand more political power. Because the patricians were so afraid of what was going to happen, the patricians are going to pretty much give the plebeians everything they want. It ends up being a 200-year period of change within the Roman Republic. Uh, for example, originally, no plebeians could serve in government, but suddenly the plebeians are given their own legislative body known as the Concilium Plebis, or the Council of the Plebe. And the Concilium Plebis could pass laws that applied to the lower class only. They didn't stop there, though. Uh, the plebeians are given their own set of magistrates, and these plebeian magistrates become known as tribunes. They do basically the same thing as a consul, except they're only supposed to be governing the lower class. But the tribunes are giving a little extra power. They can veto or they can say no to anything that a patrician magistrate does. So if a quaestor or a censor or a praetor says something and the tribune disagrees, the tribune can overrule it. After that, the plebeians are given something called the Law of the Twelve Tablets. Originally, Roman law was not written down, but this changes that. And the reason it's so important is because for the first time, the patricians and the plebeians both have equal access to the law. The laws are all made public for everybody. And the way the legal system worked was made available for everybody as well. Eventually, this rewriting of the laws and this making public of the laws leads to something called the Lex Hortensia. And the Lex Hortensia is going to give the Concilium Plebis, the Council of the Plebes, the ability to make laws that cover both social classes. So it sounds like the lower class, the plebeians, have gotten some real power and some real say, but it doesn't actually work out that way. There's this event called patronage that is going to keep the patricians in power. Uh, basically, the patricians are going to buy their way into power. They're going to offer money and things that the plebeians just can't do on their own. This is all about personal dependence. This is all about personal protection. Um, somebody with money would help you out if you needed a lawyer. Uh, the person would help in exchange for political votes. Or if you needed some sort of service, you would be given that in exchange for political power, political votes, and whoever the person was that's wealthy is known as a patron. Now, what is going to keep a patron to their word? Well, if your patron doesn't do what they say they're going to do, or if their political power doesn't represent the plebeian who they helped, well, the plebeian could vote them out, or the plebeian could kill them. 
So they, there's this working relationship between the plebeians and the patricians that is going to benefit both sides. Really. We are going to have some overseas conquest in the Roman Republic as well. In red there in that, in that little map, you can see the Roman Republic. And by 264, it has covered most of modern day Italy. The Kingdom of Carthage is going to be all of that blue, and the real focal point of overseas conquest is going to be this island of Sicily right here. You see it's half green, that's Greek, um, unclaimed, and then purple. Now this overseas conquest is going to be so important to the Romans because it's the only way that the plebeians, the lower class, can gain land and wealth is through taking them. And this is going to become known as Roman imperialism. And there's really two different ways that Roman imperialism works. In the east, in the old Greek lands, uh, those people are seen as civilized and they're basically treated very nicely. Please, please, please join us. We really value you, we want you to be part of our, our empire. But in the West, the people are treated like barbarians, and in the West, the people were just hacked and slashed and killed. Now, the best known wars that Rome is going to participate in, they're known as the Punic Wars, and there are going to be three of them. And this is going to be the city of Rome and the Roman Republic versus the city of Carthage and the Carthaginian Empire. Now what happens is in 275 BC, a Greek king named Pyrrhus is going to rise up against the Roman Republic. Rome is going to have to defeat King Pyrrhus. And as a result, Rome takes over parts of Greece. Now, King Pyrrhus had an ally in the city of Carthage, and to punish Carthage for helping King Pyrrhus, Rome is going to declare war on Carthage. Now, the First Punic War is going to last from 264 to 241, and the reason that Rome is able to win is because a ship belonging to Carthage washed up on the Roman shore the Romans are going to reverse engineer this ship and create a navy better than what Carthage had. So this brand new Roman navy is going to defeat the navy of Carthage. There is a couple years of peace, but in 221 BC, Carthage is going to attack Rome. The Second Punic War that starts in 221 BC is led by a guy named Hannibal. And Hannibal was the son of the previous leader of Carthage. And Hannibal makes a pledge to his father when his father's on his deathbed that he will avenge his father's loss. So in 221 BC, he declares war on Rome. And he is going to sail across the Mediterranean Sea into what is today Spain. And he's going to march all the way from Spain to the city of Rome. And he's going to do this while having a couple dozen elephants with him too. Now just think about getting an elephant on a boat, sailing an elephant across the Mediterranean Sea, unloading the elephant from the boat, and then marching the elephant through Spain, through southern France, over the mountains, and into Rome. Somehow Hannibal did this. The biggest battle of the Second Punic War is the Battle of Cannae. It happens in 216 BC, where Hannibal is able to surrender or surround and force a Roman army of 80,000 soldiers to surrender. And even today in 2021, the Battle of Cannae is studied in military academies around the world. 
It looked like Hannibal was about to win, but at the last minute, Rome sends out a general named Scipio Africanus to sail across the Mediterranean Sea, and he shows up in Carthage where the city is basically undefended and defeats them. Now, in 150 BC, the Third Punic War begins. Basically, Rome is just tired of Carthage, and Rome completely destroys the city in 150 BC. Now, what was like? What was life like in the Roman Republic? I've got two examples for you. The first example here is a guy who lived in the countryside. His name was Marcus Cato or Cato the Elder, and he was a patrician. He was kind of a lower level patrician. Um, so he was still wealthy class, but he didn't have a lot of money. And uh, he was also known as a pater familiar. Basically, he was the head of the family. Um, he was the oldest male. He was the most dominant male. And he had enough power in that he could legally kill his wife he could divorce her if he wanted to. Uh, he could even kill his children or sell them into slavery if he wanted to, but thankfully none of that happened. To deal with important family members, Marcus Cato would call a council of the adult males in the family. He would give them a chance to give their point of view, and then he would decide from that what he would do. The women of the family had no formal part in the family, but they probably were able to say their piece as well from what we've read. Cato was a lawyer, he was a farmer, uh, he was also fairly well off, so to speak. He didn't have a ton of money, but he knew how to use the money that he had. He writes about his wife. Unfortunately, he doesn't give her name, but we know that his wife kept up the household and took care of the kids, supervised slaves. The children played games. They had a dog. And we know from what Marcus Cato says that lunch was their biggest and most important meal of the day. And they would very often eat bread, porridge, which is like a very thick oatmeal vegetables and pork. No fish, because fish was expensive, even though they lived near an ocean. Once the food was done and, and you've eaten lunch, you take a nap, and then you wake up again when the sun has gone down a little bit and it's not hot. Now, if you're a slave or if you're hired hand, you don't get that nap. You still have to work during the hot part of the day. Slavery in Rome was actually very common, but you have to know that slavery in Rome was not based on skin color or, or anything like that. It was based on war. If you were a prisoner of war, if your side lost a war, you could become a slave and be sold to a family. In other cases, if you owe a debt and you can't pay the debt, you could be taken in as a slave as well. Marcus Cato believed in the Roman gods. These gods are impersonal. These gods are all powerful. And it's basically Greek religion repackaged in a Roman look. So as I said before, Hera is Juno, Zeus is Jupiter, so on and so on until you get the whole picture. The Roman Republic also had a really, really big city life, and the biggest city is going to be the city of Rome. Scipio Amelanus, the son of Scipio Africanus, gives us a very good look at urban life. Scipio Amelanus preferred Greek culture. He wore Greek, Greek clothes. He spoke the language Greek. He was taught Latin, he was taught Greek both. So he's learning Greek culture, he's learning Greek traditions, but he's also learning traditional Roman studies at the same time. 
in the cities, Greek art, Greek architecture, Greek buildings are all recreated and studied. And then business is done in the Roman bathhouse. Now, a lot of people think of just a bathtub that's open for everybody, but in reality, a Roman bathhouse is more like today's country club or spa, spa club. So you would have meeting places, you had workout spaces, you would have a sauna, a pool, locker rooms, places to eat. So the Roman bathhouse really becomes where most of the business in Rome is done. Now, unlike Marcus Cato, where lunch was the most important meal, for Scipio Amelanus and his friends, dinner is actually the most important meal. And it was a chance for you to show off how much money you had and how wealthy your family was. Now, the Republic is going to start falling apart right around 150 BC. The Constitution and the system of government that Rome was using was not set up for this huge empire that he created. It was meant more for just a small city or a you know, select few people. So the Roman Republic has to develop this system of provincial administration, which meant that governors were put in place. The government size grew in size, became much more expensive to run. Taxes have to be collected. The army has to expand. And it wasn't a very good time for, for the city of Rome. Almost all the land is owned by a small group of land owners. To serve in the army, you had to own land. So while these Roman soldiers are off fighting for the Republic, they, they're doing their duty. But when they come home, they find out that they no longer have land because it's been taken over and then they lose their jobs of being a soldier, and they lose their homestead, too. So unemployment in ancient Rome was going to skyrocket around 133 BC. And this is going to lead to three tyrants. Now, remember from the Greek lesson, tyrant is not necessarily a bad thing. Tyrant is just somebody who took power not through the normal process. And we really have three people who are going to be seen as tyrants. The first one is Tiberius Gracchus. He is elected tribune by the people in 133 BC, and he proposes to give public land to the soldiers so that the soldiers can continue to be soldiers. And he's going to use the Concilium Phoebus to pass this law. A bunch of patricians and a bunch of senators dislike it and Tiberius Gracchus is going to be murdered by a mob. About 10 years later, his brother Gaius Gracchus is going to be elected tribune, and he's going to try to pick up where his brother left off. So Gaius Gracchus is going to pass laws to give the food and grain to poor people. Basically, there's going to be a form of food stamps or financial assistance for food within Rome. Gaius is also going to propose sending the poor of Rome out to form colonies and see if they can revive the Roman Republic. Just like his brother, Gaius is going to be assassinated by a mob. Too. Then just a couple years later, Gaius Marius. He is unique because he served as both a tribune and a consul. Uh, he's going to reform the army completely. And he's just going to decree men without property can now serve in my military. Not only that, but any land we conquer, any land we take over will be given to my soldiers. And because of this, the soldiers in the Roman Empire begin to be loyal to Gaius Marius only. And this leads to a civil war against the Roman Senate. Now you have to wonder, where does Julius Caesar come in? Uh, Julius Caesar is going to be one of the survivors of the civil war. When the civil war is over, the Senate is going to win the war. And the Senate is going to give two of the top generals 
the power to run the government, a guy named General Crassus and General Pompey. Julius Caesar is going to defeat the Gauls, come back to Rome and say, hey, I just secured our future. And the, the Roman Senate is going to make Julius Caesar the third general in charge. And this becomes known as the Triumvirate. Now, eventually, in 50 BC, Julius Caesar is not going to be happy with being one of three, and he wants to be one of one. So he's going to march on Rome, bring his army, and he's going to seize power in Rome. Now, this wasn't for bad reasons. He wasn't doing this to take over. He was actually trying to improve the, the empire or the, the republic, if you will. So he extends full citizenship to most people living on the Roman Peninsula. He sends out colonies. About 80,000 unemployed Romans are sent out to uh, form new colonies and, and bring in tax money for Rome. And by the way, he sleeps with Cleopatra and takes over ancient Egypt as well. Now for all of his trouble, just like Gaius Marius and Gaius, um, Gaius Gracchus and Tiberius Gracchus, uh, he's murdered for his problems in 44 BC, March 17th, also known as the Ides of March. His friend Brutus stabs him. him. So that's the end of the Republic. And now we got to look at the Empire. This part is a little bit quicker. And the Roman Empire begins with a guy named Octavian Caesar or Augustus Caesar, same person. Octavian Caesar was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. And when his dad is killed, Octavian makes it his goal to seek revenge. So from 44 BC all the way until 31 BC, it's a huge civil war. Octavian is going to end the civil war and restore the government. But the Senate that he recreates is kind of weak. Octavian is going to definitely be in charge. And he's going to proclaim himself first citizen of the state. Now, this is going to be a question on the final exam, so make sure you look at this. Octavian, he's going to rename himself Augustus, and then he's going to say, I am the first citizen of the state. But that's not the only thing he's going to do. He's going to name himself the consul. He's going to name himself the tribune. He's going to make himself the pontiff. And he's going to make himself the imperator. So the consul, he's the main legal authority. The tribune potestis, that gives him the powers of the tribune and gives him power to directly legislate for people. The pontifex maximus, or pontiff, he's going to make himself the chief religious figure. And then the imperator, he is the head of the Roman army as well. Now, when you put all those different things together, declaring himself the first citizen, making himself the consul, the tribune, the pontiff, the imperator, that is the first actual emperor in world history. Once he has declared himself emperor and taken over, basically, uh, he's going to redo the military and he's going to turn the military more into a permanent force. Before this, whenever Rome needed an army, they put out a call for volunteers. Volunteers showed up and fight, and then those volunteers told us they'll get something after winning. Well, Augustus is going to make it a permanent force where it's actually paid for by the government. Augustus is going to use his army mostly to defend the empire, and rising through the, the ranks of the army becomes a viable career choice. Wherever the soldiers go, he spreads Roman language, Roman culture, and Roman ideals. And wherever Augustus is going to send the army, a cult develops around it. It's this 
weird philosophy slash religion that develops. And it's all about the emperor. Now, depending where you are, this cult takes on two different points of view. In the East, in the ancient Greek lands, there's this tradition of worshiping the king as a god. Yeah, you can look all the way back to Alexander the Great and see that he declared himself both an Egyptian god and a Greek god. So in the Hellenistic East, Augustus the person is going to be revered in worship and seen as a god. But in ancient Rome, they didn't have that same tradition. And so in Rome, the spirit of Augustus praying for the happiness and the success of the emperor became the way this was done. So whether you worshiped Augustus himself or you worshiped the idea of Augustus, this cult of Roma is going to develop and bring the Roman people together. Now it's under Augustus that the Roman Empire is going to get to its largest size it conquers Spain, increases its connection to Gaul. Britain's going to be invaded. Germany's going to be invaded. And much of modern day Europe will be under Roman control while Augustus is the emperor. The first group of Roman emperors are going to be known as the Julio or Julio Claudian. They're going to be the direct descendants of Julius Caesar. You've got Augustus, who is Caesar's adopted son. Then you have Tiberius, who is a relative of Augustus. Tiberius is a fairly weak ruler. Uh, he basically just wanted the title and then wanted the Senate to do everything. Tiberius really didn't like being the emperor and he gave one of his friends more and more and more power. Eventually, his friend Lucius Sejanus is going to assassinate him. Sejanus is caught and then executed himself for his troubles. After Tiberius comes a guy named Caligula. Caligula starts out okay, but he ends not. Uh, he got sick and he turned pretty evil. And he just starts to kill everybody because he doesn't trust anybody after he is healed. Caligula wasted a lot of money and basically bankrupted Rome. Once Caligula is out of the day, out of the way, uh, Claudius is going to take over. And he's probably the best of the Julio Claudians because uh, he tried to rule fairly. He would sit down in the Senate and listen to all sides. And he served as a judge also while he was emperor. But eventually he dies too and Nero is going to take over, and Nero is probably the worst of all of these. Uh, in the year 64 AD, Rome is going to catch on fire. Nero didn't really do much to stop it, and that's because Nero wants to rebuild the city in his own image. And by the way, he's also going to kill his mother while he's at it, too. Now, the year 69 is very bad for the Roman Empire. It's known as the Year of Four Emperors. And it starts in March of 69 AD when the military rebels against Nero and kills him. Once Nero is out of the way, the governor of Spain, his name is Galba, is going to declare himself emperor. He marches an army to Rome and makes the Roman not Roman Republic, but the Roman Senate crown him. But a number of pieces of the government and a number of pieces of the military refused to, um, to give him loyalty. So in January 69, he is now in charge, but the governor of Lusitania, which is Portugal, named Otho is going to pay members of the group that guards the emperor to kill Galba. 
So Galba is assassinated by Otho. Now, just a little short note, if you're curious why Otho assassinates Gal Galba, it's because Otho thought he was next in line for the throne, and when he was passed over for Galba, it just made him completely furious. So Galba replaces Nero, Otho replaces Galba, but there's another person named Vitellius who declares himself emperor and then overthrows Otho, who has just overthrown Galba. Now, Otho and Vitellius, they go to war, they battle each other, and when Vitellius defeats Otho, Otho takes his own life to try and stop the civil war from occurring. When Vitellian takes over the government, there's yet one more challenge. The hero of the Holy Land, Vespasian, the one who defeated the Jewish revolt in 79 AD, is going to be declared emperor by his troops. And then Vespasian's troops are going to bring him to Rome where he is able to defeat Vitellius and gain control of the government. So this is called the year of four emperors because there are four different emperors who take over after Nero in less than one year's time. Now Vespasian is going to found another dynasty. He's going to become the head of a dynasty that lasts for a while. And they're known as the Flavian dynasty because Vespasian's real name was Titus Flavius Vespasianus. Now the Flavians are going to suppress revolts, they're going to destroy the temple in Jerusalem. The Jewish people are kicked out of the Holy Land under Vespasian, and the Jewish people don't return to the Holy Land until 1946. Now it's Vespasian who's going to give power to his two sons, and it's Vespasian who officially makes the Roman Empire monarchy. Now the Flavians will be replaced by another dynasty called the Antonines, and the Antonines are arguably the best emperors that Rome sees. There's Emperor Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antonius Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. Now Hadrian, just to give you an example, uh, he's born in Spain but he's educated in Rome. So it shows how the different parts of the empire are coming together. Uh, he served in the army. He led the soldiers, so he knew what the soldiers wanted. He knew how to speak to them, and they were very loyal to him. He's trained by his cousin Trajan on how to be a good leader and how to serve in the government. And when he comes to power, he's going to reorganize the Roman government. And he's going to reorganize the army to make it all career-based and success-based. And he's going to give many different paths to rise to the top in Roman civilization. Now, what really changes in the life of these Roman people during the empire versus the republic. Well, not a whole lot changes, but there are a few things. For one, the Roman army is no longer an army of conquest, it's purely an army of defense. And by the time we get to the later Roman empire, only the officers in the army are actually Roman. Pretty much everybody else is what would be called a barbarian. They don't have a lot of loyalty to Rome. Rome was very big, 750,000 people. If you want to put that in perspective, Atlanta today has less than 500,000. So I think the number now is about 5,200, yeah, 5, 525,000 people is how many Atlanta has. So Rome was a significant amount bigger. Rome has problems with sanitation, Rome has problems with fire and water and crime, but the, seat, oh, the city overall was fairly clean. 
but the city of Rome could not feed everybody, so welfare was common to receive in Rome. If you didn't receive welfare, it meant you were very, very wealthy. Entertainment of the day was all about gladiator battles and chariot races. Uh, there were several teams of chariot drivers who went around the country every few weeks. Gladiators fought in the Colosseum, and they were very often slaves or debtors, or in some cases, criminals and volunteers. The provinces become increasingly important as more and more people settle there, and roads are built to connect these cities together and they're originally used by the U.S. Army. And in reality, these provincial cities become more important than the Roman Empire. Just like the Roman Republic came to an end, the Roman Empire is going to come to an end, too. When Marcus Aurelius dies in 180, there's a civil war that's going to break out shortly after. His son Commodus isn't very good. He's very childlike. Attention. Um, he's going to declare himself a god. He's going to name everything after himself, and he's going to get assassinated for his issue. In 193 BC, a guy named Septimus Servus is going to take control of the government. His control is just very short as well. And before you know it, between 235 and 284, there are 20 different emperors. Nobody lasts for very long. In 293, the emperor Diocletian is going to divide the empire into four parts because he's thinking that dividing it into four and having four smaller emperors that work together will make things better. But that falls apart when Constantine and Maxentius have the Battle of the Milvia Bridge, which you'll read about this week. Then finally, Constantine, when he gets in charge, is going to build the city of Constantinople. And the empire is going to be split into two. And eventually the Western Empire will die off while the Eastern Empire survives and becomes known as something else. And we'll talk about that in a week or two. All right, so there's a lot of stuff to go through, and I apologize that this is almost an hour-long video, but the Roman Republic and Roman Empire, it's important to know that they're two different things, but there's definitely very important information about both that reflect both our landscape today, in some ways probably our actions today, and definitely how the world works. All right, so after all that, it's now 10, 11 a.m. and I just wanna remind you that you have from whenever this video is uploaded, which should be about five minutes from now, until Monday the 12th at 11.59 p.m. to so send me an email saying that you watched this video. And if I get that email from you, I'll give you five extra points on your midterm exam. Until next time, thank you for watching this. Thank you for putting up with it. And let me know if I can help you in any way.